bless our, our time uh, in the word this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, chapter 8 is about the security that we have in Jesus Christ. Remember that we said it begins with, there therefore is no condemnation uh, to those that are in Christ Jesus. And it ends with, there is no separation uh, at all. Uh, Paul has certainly uh, emphasized the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. At the end of chapter 7, uh, he is crying out, O wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? Uh, trying to live the Christian experience through his own means, through his own strength. But he says, thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. That's who he's going to uh, rely upon and look to. And then in chapter 8, he begins to talk about uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. The Holy Spirit is mentioned in this chapter more than any other chapter in the New Testament. Uh, and he's already covered uh, these wonderful subjects about the fact that uh, every person that's here this morning that has received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior has the Holy Spirit uh, dwelling in them. And that we have this incredible access to God, so much so that when we pray, uh, we actually, as he says, can pray, Abba, Father. And uh, I have to admit that uh, uh, when the last time we were in Jerusalem and we were walking down the street in the old city and it's very crowded and everything, and I noticed this uh, little guy holding his dad's hand up, up in front of me. Uh, I knew, obviously, they were uh, Jewish because his dad had his kippah on, uh, and he was kind of holding on to him, go through, and I wasn't really stalking him, but I was trying to get close enough because I wanted to hear if he would say this. And sure enough, sooner or later, he pulled his dad by the uh, shirt tail and said, Abba, Abba. I knew what he said. I could translate that Hebrew word. <laughs> Hebrew and Aramaic is, the sa Aramaic is the same. He was saying daddy. And again, this is the prayer, the uses that Jesus uses in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he goes to the cross when he prays, Abba, Father. Uh, and, uh, and Paul says that's the kind of access that we have uh, to God. Uh, he also says the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us. Even when we don't know how to pray ourselves, when we are at a loss, maybe like uh, the family this morning, in their groanings, even the Holy Spirit can intercede uh, on their behalf. Uh, he even mentions that we've been sealed uh, in the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.28 is probably one of the most uh, loved passages of Scripture uh, in, in the New Testament. Probably why R.A. Torrey said that it's a pillow for a tired heart. Uh, and certainly we can understand the, the logic of what Paul is saying here because we would uh, all agree that God has a perfect plan for each of our lives because he is perfect in everything that he does. Uh, he is also all-knowing uh, in, uh, in everything, uh, and therefore he's in a position uh, to make a perfect plan for each and every one of us. He's omniscient, meaning he's uh, all-wise, he is eternal, he knows all things, He's perfect in his holiness, even in the way he deals with uh, and judges sin perfectly. Uh, and therefore, uh, again, I just hope that uh, this passage will open up a little bit to you, though, though it's probably a familiar one to you. First thing we want to say about uh, verse 28 is that it gives us confidence in any circumstance. Again, it says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. And there's really four aspects about this, uh, this confidence. What kind of circumstances are we talking about? We're talking about circumstances you normally wouldn't rejoice in. We're talking about the difficult circumstances uh, uh, of our, our life. Uh, and the first one is we can have confidence because of what we know. Uh, when he says we know here, uh, he could have used a couple of different Greek terms. He could have used gnoskos, which means use something you know experientially. But he doesn't. He uses a different term, oida, which means uh, to know by facts. So he's saying that every believer knows certain things, knows certain facts. Uh, it's in a perfect tense, which means it's something that's already accomplished and has continued results uh, into the future. Uh, we already know, as I said, that God does have a perfect plan for, uh, for all of our lives. Uh, he then connects, there's, a, there's the conjunction and, and we know, so it ties us with the previous passage. So what does that say? Well, it's talking about the, the things that I've already mentioned and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ because of what he's done for us on the cross. In verse 24 in this chapter, he says, where we were saved in this hope, uh, Jesus dying for our sins. But hope that is seen as uh, not hope, for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. We, ha we haven't really fully realized all that God's done for us on the cross. We've been forgiven. 
We'll talk in a moment about being justified, as Paul's already covered that. Uh, and we are experiencing the Holy Spirit working in our lives. Uh, but we're not there yet. We're not glorified yet. We're not in the image of God yet, the things that he's already mentioned. Uh, but we wait for it with perseverance, and we have the hope of it. And so there's certain things, and we know. We can basically get through difficult times and difficult circumstances because of certain facts that we know, that God loves us, that God cares about us, that God has a plan for us, that as God is watching, and he knows everything that we're going through and every emotion that we've, we're going through. Not only that, he can relate to them because he knows what it is to be betrayed. He knows what it is to, to uh, go through physical pain. He knows what it is to experience really everything that you and I might experience uh, because he's been there and he's done that. And certainly, Paul is writing to these first century listeners, primarily at this point, a Jewish audience. Uh, they would have just read, or they may have just read in the letter, uh, what preceded it in chapter 8. But there are certain things that they knew as well. The implication is that, and we know, is this is common knowledge. So this is common knowledge to all, all, all believers. Uh, this idea that uh, God is working, God has a, uh, has a plan. I mentioned uh, at one time uh, a book that I read a while back called The Survivor's Club that was all about, each chapter was a different incident, everything from POWs to people going through horrific car accidents and different things, and how they survived. Uh, and the secular writer, uh, basically at the end of the book, comes to the conclusion that the way that people survive horrendous things in their lives is that they all had certain commonalities. They had a belief in God, they believed that God was with them in the midst of their circumstances. God had a plan for their life, and therefore he had allowed it, and therefore God is going to bring them through the other side. This is what this secular author came up with and, uh, and certainly lived out in the pages of, uh, of the book. And that's, that's right on. That's exactly the kind of things when he says, and we know. Those are all the things that should be common knowledge to us so that we can get through difficult circumstances we can have a uh, confidence because of what we know. Secondly, we can have a confidence in the ultimate good that will come. Now, Romans 8.28 does not mean everything will turn out okay. That's not what it means. It means that everything will turn out good in an eternal sense. Everything will turn out in a way that brings glory uh, to God. All things means good and bad, bright and dark, sweet and bitter. Easy and hard, happy and sad, prosperity and poverty, health and sickness, calm and storm, comfort and suffering, life and death, all things means all things, said one writer. But it doesn't mean that all things are good. It's not a good thing when you lose, lose someone that you love and you care about. It's not a good thing necessarily when you lose your job. It's not necessarily a good thing uh, when your car breaks down in the middle of the freeway. You know, we just experience difficult things in this life, certainly some much more meaningful than, uh, than others. It doesn't mean that whatever happens to us, I'm going to feel really good about it later. That's not what it's saying. We could use the example of Cain and Abel. Abel was a righteous guy. He was a faithful young guy, walking with God, serving God, worshiping God in an appropriate way, having a wonderful relationship with God. What happens to him? His brother's jealous and, and kills him. Uh, and then we look at that and go, I don't, know that, I don't think that was so good. I don't really see how that worked out for good. Well, again, apparently it did because his death then brought about a testimony that you and I read about on the pages of Scripture today and continues to uh, impact lives. The writer of Hebrews was so impressed by Abel, he included him in what we call the Hall of Fame of Faith there in chapter 11, verse 4 says, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and through it, uh, he being dead, still speaks. He still speaks to us. There's an inappropriate way to come to God, like uh, Abel, and there's an appropriate way. There's one way to come to God, and now it's through Jesus Christ. And Abel still, though he died, still lives on, and uh, his life and what happened to him and his tragic death is still being used for good and being used for God's glory. It doesn't mean everything's going to be okay tomorrow, but it means God has a reason, God has a purpose, God has allowed it, and God will bring us through the other side one way or another. What about the issue of sin? Can God even use sin when it happens to us? 
to bring out good and glory to him. Well, there's some wonderful examples of that. Uh, and we'll talk about Joseph certainly in a moment. He's key to this whole thing. Uh, but the issue of sin we certainly see in a young woman named Ruth who's a Moabitess. She worships idols. Uh, she lives far from, uh, from Israel. Uh, has no thought about God or the one true God or anything else. But we know that uh, her to-be mother-in-law, Naomi, and her husband and the two sons uh, in sin, uh, in a lack of faith, leave Israel and go to a place they should have never been in sin because there was a drought. They didn't want to trust God. They went somewhere they shouldn't have been. And, of course, then the two sons marry these two Moabite, uh, Moabite gals. Uh, the, the husband dies, the two, uh, the two sons die, and of course you remember the story of one of the daughters-in-law determines to go back to her own people, uh, but Ruth is committed at this point to the God of Israel uh, into caring for her mother-in-law Naomi, and she goes back to Israel. Uh, and even though her life all began in sin, how she came into a relationship uh, with her Israeli husband uh, was all in sin, but she comes back in faith and of course eventually meets and then marries her kinsman redeemer for the family Boaz wonderful love story uh, there in the Old Testament and she becomes actually uh, in the lineage of David uh, and eventually of Jesus Christ all things work for good for those who love the Lord it didn't start out too good did it e even sin won't prevent God from working out his plan of redemption uh, in his plan in our own lives and of course We've got to talk about Joseph because he is the classic example. And when we talk about those first century uh, listeners, uh, they wouldn't have had so much of the New Testament that we have, but they still would have had these, these stories in the Old Testament. Uh, they would have had the story of Joseph, three J's. Here it is. What, what do we know? What is common knowledge? The story of Joseph, the story of Job, and then Jeremiah. We've got it on the wall. You can read it every, every time you come to church, in and out now. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, declare the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. God says to backsliding Israel before they go into the captivity. And, uh, and he has a plan for each of our lives. Job helps us understand that nothing can come into our lives against us until it is first passed through the will of God. The devil, Satan, has to go to God, appear before God. God is bragging about, about Job. Have you considered my, my servant Job? I don't know if you really want God bragging about you, but uh, he's bragging about Job. And, ah, well, the only reason he worships you is because you've blessed him. Well, we'll start taking some stuff away. And, of course, he loses his health. He loses his family. He loses his, his property and all of his possessions. Uh, but through it all, we come to understand something about uh, how things work in terms of suffering uh, and our attitude and what's going on beside, uh, behind the scenes. And of course, with Joseph, then, it's just the, the classic, as we said, when we went through him, the sin committed against him through the brothers selling him into slavery versus killing him. Uh, and then the whole episode of his basically rising to the point of being prime minister because he believed that God was always with him. He believed that God had a plan for his life. And even when he was rotting in a prison, accused of a sexual crime that he never committed, he still believed and he still trusted God. And he after, even after he interpreted those dreams and said, please remember me, and the guy didn't remember him, he still rested and trusted in a sovereign God who knew where he was, what was going on, and still had a plan for his life. And we know that he never became bitter in any of this because of his actions, his attitudes, and even the names that he gave to his children. It was tough. It was difficult. I think when they threw Joseph in the pit, he wasn't down there in the bottom going, it's all good. All work together for good. No problem. I got this. You know, like 14, going to Egypt. No problem. I don't think he was doing that. I'm sure he was in tears. And what were his brothers doing? They were eating and joking. They could care less about him. And of course, part of that whole story is the beautiful uh, passage of repentance by, by Judah uh, and um, what he has to say to, uh, to Joseph in the end. And then after our whole study in Genesis on that, we said that we need to, like Joseph, have remember, we need to have 50-20 vision. Remember 20-20 vision that some of us used to have? That means that when you have it, you can see things plainly in front of you. But if you have 50-20 vision, you can see beyond that and see what God is doing. And that's from Genesis 50, 20. When Joseph says to the brothers at the end, 
what you meant for evil, God meant for good, and the saving of many lives. So Joseph becomes the classic example. So even the first century listeners, uh, these uh, Jewish folks that were getting this epistle from Paul, uh, they would know about Joseph, they would know about Job, and certainly they would know the passage from uh, Jeremiah. We have all of that. We have reason to say, and we know. And, uh, and the good that's coming about uh, is a good that is for God's glory and for us in an eternal perspective. Dr. Barnhouse says this in his commentary, uh, There is no will or active creatures... Men, angels, or demons that can do other than work for our good. No, no dog can bark against us. I felt like a few have, so that's good to know. No man can speak or act against us. No sinister power of evil can be against us. But all must be for our good. All things work together for our good. Otherwise, the Lord would not permit it. And of course, the specific good that he's going to mention is to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ, which certainly is, should be our goal and certainly would be to his glory. The third thing about this confidence is, uh, is it's because we've been called. It's the idea that God has called and some has accepted. And Paul basically divides the world into three groups of people in terms of responding to the call. And we see that in 1 Corinthians 1.23. He says, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block. That's one group. To the Greeks, foolishness. That's another group. But to those who are called, the called ones, both Jews and Greeks or Gentiles, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So the Jews were still, those that had not received the call, were still trusting in the Mosaic Covenant, uh, the rituals and so forth. Uh, the Greeks or the Gentiles were still trusting in their own wisdom uh, and in their own philosophies. But there's a group of both, Jews and Gentiles, that make up the church that have accepted the preaching of the cross and been forgiven of their sins. We fall into one of those, one of those three, uh, three categories. And he says it's based on a calling uh, that comes to us. Uh, we can also see in confidence that this is not for people that don't know the Lord. There's a, two qualifying statements. All things work together for good because there's certain facts we know and we can rely upon. And who is it for? Those who are called and those who love God. Those who have not been called yet, those who don't love God yet, they fall into another category. And not everything works for good for them. For them, when stuff happens, it's just a bummer. And, so, and it's like... Uh, okay, hope that's going to work out. Now, we're praying that maybe sometimes bad circumstances will bring people to their knees uh, and they'll cry out and receive the Lord. So maybe in that sense it can work for good. But generally, things are not working for good for them. Uh, they're in a whole different category. John puts it this way, 1 John 5, 19. We know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. We're with God and everybody else is being swayed uh, by the wicked one, he says. The full idea is expressed in the Greek paraphrase this way. We know that we are of God and the whole world is lying in the power of the seductive embrace of the evil one. Uh, that's, that's the position of the person that has never come to faith in Christ. Therefore, this verse might be translated for them, Romans 8, 28. All things work together for ill because they do not love the Lord. Because they're lying in the lap of the wicked one, resting in his embrace, captives of his will. What a terrible position to be in. What a contrast to be able to go through difficult times and know that, well, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why this happened, but I still know that God loves me. I still know that he has a plan. I still know that he's watching over. I, and uh, I just got to trust him until we get to the other side of this somehow. And maybe someday I'll understand the good in it. And I sure pray that he gets the glory from it. And sometimes, of course, that is a process. Joseph, I think, came to those conclusions, certainly. I don't know that he was yelling that <laughs> out of the pit or when they uh, uh, you know, tie him up in a, in a rope and hook him to the back of a camel and march him through the desert on his way to Egypt. I don't know that he was singing praises or anything. Uh, but I think he comes to those conclusions, or he doesn't come out the other side uh, the way that he does. How can the Apostle Paul and Silas be beaten and thrown into a prison at Philippi, and their response is to worship God? I think they really believed this. And they knew, and we know, it would come in knowledge to them. 
The fourth thing about this confidence is that we can have it because God is always at work. Works together is present tense. God is continuously working in the circumstances of your life and my life for good. Isaiah 54, 17 says, No weapon that is formed against us shall prosper. And again, nothing can touch the believer that has not yet gone through the will of God. And that's why we're so thankful for the, the whole story uh, in the book of Job in the Old Testament. And it's why Job could say uh, at the end of his trials in Job 13, 15, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Not taking the advice of his lovely wife, of course, which was to curse God and die. <laughs> kind of nice when you've got an encouraging wife or person around you going, going through uh, difficult times. Job didn't even have that. But he still was going to uh, trust the Lord and believe that God had a plan for everything that was happening to him. So we can have a confidence uh, in any circumstance. Uh, and it's not easy. It's, it's, you know, bad things happen, and we just have to process them and, and, and kind of get back to at some point. Because we're just, we're, sometimes we're just flattened emotionally, and we're, we're back in that previous paragraph. We're just groaning, and the Holy Spirit is making intercession for us because we can't even get the words together to express what's going on in our own hearts. But there's a process that we should go through and come back to what we know, that we all know, that it's uh, common knowledge. And we can know that God is working. It's a process, working things out for good. We can have a confidence in any circumstance. And also we can have a confidence, secondly, because we're chosen by God. That's in the first half of verse 29. There Paul says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So being chosen, we would say, is for the whosoever's. It's for everyone. Whosoever that would come, God would uh, call you. God would uh, uh, would choose you. And of course, there's a you know huge debate uh, you know within Christianity, you know at least for the last uh, you know five or six hundred years or so. This idea that of God's uh, God's electing, God's predestining, and so forth, uh, which is a wonderful doctrine in the Bible that's meant to be a blessing to us. Uh, and when we come to it. Uh, as Calvary Chapel guys teaching, we teach it. We just teach what the Bible says. Uh, at the same time, uh, when we come to a passage that talks about man's free will choice, we just teach it because that's, that's when the Bible, anybody that would come. Uh, Jesus says he's uh, overlooking the city uh, of Jerusalem, uh, knowing what is, awaits him. He says, Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, you who stoned the prophets and killed those sent to you, how I, this is what he says, how I long to gather you together like a hen gathers her chicks. What was the problem? You were not willing. This is what I wanted to do, but you weren't willing. God honors free will choice. So how do we square that with pre predestination? We don't. And I'm okay with that. You know, but there's a lot of people like, no, it's got to be one or the other. One to the exclusion of the other. No, we just teach one when we get to it because it's meant to be a blessing. And I don't mind being blessed. Uh, and when uh, and Paul's teaching about security, he's going to bring this doctrine up and talk about it because it's meant to be a blessing to us. And as one pastor said, it certainly lays the axe to the root of pride that anyone could have in regards to salvation because it was all, it was all God. It was all what, what he did. <laughs> I love uh, tell you too, uh, when I get to deep theological issues, I always go to J. Vernon McGee. Just give me a country guy from Texas to explain this to me, you know, and as long as he's got a Ph.D., and, uh, and uh, which he does. And uh, uh, he, he says, you know, it's like, the, it's like the young guy that was saying, explaining about being saved. And he says, well, you know, uh, I did my part and God did his part. What do you mean you did your part and God did his part? He goes, well, I did my part. I was an angry young sinner running away from God as fast as I could get. And God did his part. He chased me down with his grace and his love and his mercy and he forgave me. I did my part and he did his part. <laughs> And that's really how it is with, with, with all of us, whether we would express it that way or not. Uh, John, uh, Jesus says in John 3.18, it's really not an intellectual issue. It's not a theological issue. It's just a sin issue. Verse 18 of John 3, Jesus says, He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. 
For everyone practicing evil hates the light, does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. The problem is not an intellectual one or a theological one. This idea of chosen is just simply people do not receive the call because their deeds were evil. They don't want to come into the light, and there's a reason for it. Another quick J. Vernon McGill illustration, very heavy theologically. He says, it's like the guy that was walking along, and he came into a, a little swamp area, and there were 10 turtles there. And he said to the 10 turtles, how many of you would like to learn how to fly? And only one turtle said, I would like to learn how to fly. The others didn't respond at all. So he took the one turtle, and he taught it how to fly. It's not because he despised or didn't love or didn't care about the other turtles. It's just that there was only one that wanted to learn how to fly. Only one received the calling. I don't know if you can grasp the deep theological <laughs> truth there. <coughs> That's God's calling on us. It's just a matter of our responding to him. God does not predestine people to hell. God does not predestine people to not be able to receive the, the gospel. The Bible doesn't teach that anywhere. It just says that his call goes out and some respond and some do not respond. Uh, and uh, uh, very maybe too simply illustrated there. <laughs> but Paul wants us to be secure. And he wants us to see that being chosen is, uh, is a blessing. Uh, he tells us in Ephesians 1 that it started in eternity past. And, uh, and that God predetermined that one day his son would come and die on the sin on the cross for our sins. Uh, and those of us that have heard that call uh, have recognized then that we've been chosen by him. Sometimes we, we illustrate it uh, uh, this way. Uh, it's uh, taken on a lot of different forms, but it's just simply, uh, if you got a, a little invitation uh, in the mail, it said resident, then have your name, just said resident, you get some of those in the mail, it's got your address, but it's uh, free dinner to a beautiful restaurant in uh, Honolulu, it's Chai's Bistro or whatever, and it's like, wow, I've always wanted to go there. That's pretty free dinner. I'm definitely going. So you go down there, you walk in there, there's a little reception area. You, you give them your card and go, here's my free dinner for the card. It says resident on it. Okay, thank you. Go right in. We've been expecting you. Somebody's going to seat you, and then they sit you at a table, and there it is, a little name card with your name on it. Well, I thought this invitation was just for everybody, but it was, but it was for you in particular. It's meant to be a blessing. To know that the call goes out to everyone, but when we receive it, God called you in particular. God in eternity past wanted to save you in particular. And God in eternity past already determined a plan and a purpose for your life. So that you can know that all things will work together for good. In this life and all eternity and for his, his glory. It's meant to give us a confidence in any circumstance, it's because we've been chosen, and it's also because we'll be changed one day to be like Jesus. Verse 29, again, the second half says, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. So, uh, conformed to the image of His Son uh, is, uh, is a, a really powerful statement when you think about it. Uh, and again, I quote from the NIV because I'm bilingual. And, uh, but, uh, uh, and I like it for a lot of different reasons, but uh, uh, here's where it kind of drops the ball because he says it's going to make us in the likeness of the sun. And that's not what it says in the Greek. In the Greek, it's like you take a, an image, whether it's a coin or anything out, and you push it into clay and you pull it off. That's, that's it. That's the image. It's not the idea that someday you'll be kind of like Jesus. As, no, someday you'll be like Jesus. You'll be made in the image of Jesus. And certainly, there's two aspects of that. The, the resurrected body that we'll receive at the rapture of the church. Uh, and certainly, the idea of God working in our hearts and our minds right now by his spirit, graciously, uh, to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. Let's uh, deal with this issue of being changed because he's the firstborn among many brothers. That word simply means, it doesn't mean he was born first, like first in order. It's just a word, it's a phrase that means preeminent, the one and only, the one and only Jesus. That's what's being said here. The writer of Hebrew uses it in chapter 1, verse 6, exalting Jesus. Uh, there it says, but when he again, Jesus, 
again, be, uh, brings the firstborn into the world. God brings the firstborn, Jesus, into the world. He says, let all the angels of God worship him. Uh, Jesus is the preeminent, the one and only, and therefore every angel will bow down and worship him, unlike what the Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and others might, might say uh, about him. In Colossians 1.15, he uses the same phrase uh, of Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He is the preeminent one. He is the one and only over all creation. Later in chapter 2, verse 7, it says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. It's, it's, you know, the Bible is pretty explicit uh, as long as you take it uh, in, in context. Uh, but again, he is the firstborn. He is the preeminent one, and we're being made into his image. Physically, again, that will happen when we're with the Lord at the rapture of the church. It will occur. Philippians 3.20 says that our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies. Some of us are a little more lowly than others. Our lowly bodies, so they will be like his glorious one. And, uh, and that's a wonderful passage. Uh, 1 John 3.3 3 talks about when we see him, uh, we'll be like him. Not kind of like him, we'll be like him, the image. Paul's trying to make it more powerful for us. Then we actually uh, stopped at, at a point in time and did a topical message on 2 Corinthians 3.18. Remember, we with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory. And we're being transformed, we're metamorphosis, into his glory, uh, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. It's a work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to make us more like Jesus right now uh, as he's conforming us to his image. And how do we do that? Well, the, uh, the metaphor, the example was Moses. Moses would go up in Mount Sinai, stand in the presence of God. He would come back down and he'd be glowing. He'd put a veil over his face because he would stop glowing at some point. In time. He'd go back up and kind of get recharged and then come back and be in their presence again. That's the metaphor. What is the glory that we stand in front of? And we said the greatest glory that we can experience in this life is through his word. So as we get into his word... We receive his glory and see his glory, and he transforms us. And we need to keep going back to that word, and back to that word, and he uses it to change us into the image of Jesus Christ. One day it will happen physically, spiritually, it's happening already in the images of Jesus, the firstborn, the preeminent one, the one and only, not kind of like, but to the image of. So we can have confidence in any circumstance if we understand what God is doing and what he will do ultimately. Being chosen is meant to be a blessing. Being changed, something that's happening now ultimately will occur at the rapture of the church. Uh, and then in verse 30, a chain of promises that leads to glorification. Verse 30, moreover whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also Glorified. So we'd say the chain of promise indicates a 100% success rate. You kind of track along with that. If he predestined you, he's going to call you. If he calls you, he's going to justify you. If he, if he justified you, almost all of you get glorified. That's not what it says. That it says all. Uh, all means all. Looked it up in the Greek. All is always all. That's all that all is. <laughs> It's like we could have a sign over there as you signed your kids into uh, Sunday school this morning saying 95% rate. In other words, you drop your kids off at Sunday school, every 100 kids we get, we only lose five. 95% rate. That's pretty good, 95%, you know. Take your chances. Maybe that's why some of you keep coming back. I don't know. I can personally testify we all have... They're all great kids in Sunday school. I talk to them every week. But uh, I have my wife's word on that. But uh, uh, that, that's not much of a success rate when it comes to something that important, is it? And uh, this is pretty important, isn't it? And uh, again, how, how did this all start in chapter 8? Trying to give us a, a sense of security and confidence in our relationship with Christ. There, therefore, so a double adverb. He's, again, he was referring not to just the previous passage, but the the whole of what he was saying in the argument, that we're saved by faith alone. Therefore, there, because we're saved by faith alone, therefore there is now no, and we actually said in the Greek, it's a double negative. So in the English it would be, therefore there is now no, no, not ever, no, not ever, 
ever any condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And then he follows it up here with this idea that, hey, whoever he predestined, he calls them. And whoever he calls, he justifies them. And who he justifies, everyone, 100%, are going to be glorified. I think we can be thankful for the faithfulness of God to uh, finish the work that he's begun in our lives. The chain continues, and again, this is referred to by many authors as the golden chain of promises, because again, it begins with predestination. Uh, that's a Greek word that just said into English is the word horizon. It means to mark out a horizon ahead of time, as in making a plan ahead of time. God has a plan ahead of time. Uh, the chain enters history with us at our calling. Again, the work of the Holy Spirit coming and uh, tugging on our hearts and uh, drawing us to him, showing us that, that we are sinners and that we need to be forgiven. And we have that conviction. Paul says this in 2 Thessalonians 2.13, but uh, we're bound to give thanks to God always for you, brother and beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we should be thankful. Paul's thankful for them because from the beginning God, God chose them and brought salvation to them and that sanctification, this thing we've been talking about, the, the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Why? Because they responded and they believed in truth. They were the turtles and wanted to fly. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. We, uh, uh, we responded to the call. Uh, and it's a beautiful thing. We should give thanks for it. Uh, and, uh, and again, when, you're sh when I'm sharing sometimes, I'll even say that. When you're sharing with a friend or a family member that doesn't know Christ, and they're kind of open to what you're saying. They're kind of receiving what you're saying. Uh, and you're thinking like, wow, this is kind of a change of heart here. You know, uh, used to be by the time I got this part and got the word Jesus out a few times, he's already cussing me. So you know, we're making some headway here, you know. And uh, at that point, you could appropriate say, and I can see that God is working in your life. That the Holy Spirit is beginning to reveal Jesus to you. You were opposed to me. You used to not want to hear this. You're open to it now, aren't you? Isn't it a good thing to know that God loves you? Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to know that you could be in heaven for all eternity? If that even sounds good to you, it's because God is working in your life. That means he cares about you. He loves you. He's calling you. Just respond to it. That, that's what it's saying, isn't it? Uh, and that would be a good thing for us to be able to say uh, to those around us that maybe we're trying to, to share with. The chain makes reference to our forgiveness using the term justification that Paul has spent quite a bit of time developing early on in, in Romans. Again, it's a ju ju judicial term. It simply means the judge pounds his gavel down and says, not guilty. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ and we ask him to forgive us of our sins, he does. He forgives us of our sins. It says we're completely innocent. We sometimes say, but with a qualifying statement, justification means just as if you haven't sinned. In God's sight, that's a qualifying statement. Listen, we sin in this life and we pay a price for it. You know, I can, jump, I can jump off the poly today and go, Lord, forgive me. That was really a dumb thing to do. Guess what? Gravity is going to take me and I'm going to still hit the ground. There's consequences to my actions. So being justified doesn't mean I don't experience consequences of my sin, things that I've done or I might continue to do, but it does mean in God's sight, he never holds it against me. It's never on the record uh, anymore. It's completely done away with. We'd say it's covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. This chain makes reference to our forgiveness. And then finally it concludes with glorification. In whom he justified, them he also uh, glorified. Now, this is something interesting here. Language-wise, he uh, uses a past tense, uh, appropriate translated that way, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, English here. Uh, why does Paul say that we've already been glorified? You know, I, I don't feel too glorified when I got it this morning. I feel better after a couple of cups of coffee. I just have to tell you that. But uh, I was a little more glorified after a, after a little Starbucks this morning. But, uh, uh, but uh, that's not going to get me all the way there. Uh, and... Uh, uh, as my knee starts hurting, as the knee goes on, I'll be reminded how much further I need to be glorified. But uh, uh, different, uh, sorry, as you get older, you talk more about your aches and pains. <laughs> you also make lots of sounds when you, when you sit down and when you get up and, uh, and so forth. But uh, uh, we're looking forward, some of us are looking forward a little more to this idea of glorification. 
But Paul talks about it in the past tense as though it's already happened because in God's sight, it has. Because he's not going to lose anybody. So it's just a few more ticks on the clock of eternity. It's not much. Paul says our life here is like a vapor. It's like a shadow. It's going very quickly. Uh, and, uh, and then we're going to be with the Lord. Uh, and it's already a done deal in terms of our glorifications. That means in heaven, uh, uh, in terms of Christ's character, we'll have the same gentleness, the same self-control, the same perfect love. Wouldn't you love to never have a selfish thought? How would you like to be around a lot of people that never had a selfish thought? <laughs> Even if you had a few of your own. But uh, none of us will. Uh, that, that's the idea of the image of, of Jesus. Uh, and it should be a wonder to us just to study the Gospels and watch Jesus and watch how he deals with people. And kids were always, they had no issue with coming and, and being with Jesus. They were never afraid of him or never intimidated. No, nobody was. Uh, he always went to the person that was hurting the most. Everybody was comfortable with him. Uh, and just see how, how he lived his life. That's what it'll be like. That's what it'll be like. So it's, it's a wonder for us to read the Gospels and, and think about what the future and what it means in terms of glorification. Not just a, a, a brand new body, but what the Lord will bring to who we really are and who he meant us to be uh, from all eternity. I, uh, I wanted to close with one, one little story here at the end of this idea. And, and there's certainly there's a, there's a temptation when we come to Romans 8.28 to, to just to tell some stories. And, uh, and you and I, between us, we've got some pretty good stories to tell about bad things that happened and how God used them for his glory. And, uh, uh, and it's one of the things that we like to tell each other about because it's common knowledge that, uh, that God does this. And, uh, but one story in particular uh, came, came to my mind because the, the person actually quoted, quoted the verse. And it was, uh, <coughs> and uh, Kenny knows who it is. It was one of our friends from the Big Island. But he was here. And, uh, and he was about ready to get married. And uh, uh, Uncle Doug and I uh, were with him. We were praying for him. It was a beautiful ceremony out on uh, Turtle Bay out there at the Hilton. And uh, it was a long time coming because uh, uh, he, he had said to me, the, and the background on it, he said, you know, 20, 20 some years ago, when I came home from work one day, my wife was gone and there was a note that said she was never coming back again. Uh, and she didn't. I thought my life was over. And, there, and this verse came to my mind and I thought, I don't see it. I don't see any good. How can good come from this? Two little kids to raise as a single dad. <clears throat> Shortly after that time, he moved to Hawaii, and that's about the time that, uh, that we met him. And he did an awesome job as a, as a single dad. Now, that's not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing for a single mom. Uh, but he did a great job. Two great kids that are both uh, adults now uh, in everything, and just went through that, that whole period of uh, working hard and raising his kids. And, uh, staying plugged in and part of the part of the church uh, and everything, uh, and now it's years it's years later, and he's about ready to get married uh, after uh, being a single dad for 20 20 plus years. A wonderful Christian uh, woman, and he, and he said to me uh, after we prayed, he said, you know, 20 something years ago when my wife left left me, I could have never believed there could be any good that could come out of this. But today, today, it's good. Today is the good, and God is allowing me to see it. And I'm thankful to be here. And he trusted God all those years. And I just want to make this, this last point. It, you know, I think we all agree with this verse, what it says, and the truth of it. It's very difficult sometimes to go through hard things and be able to appropriate it for ourselves. And the idea isn't that it's all going to be okay the next day or the next week or the next month. Nor is it the idea that somehow God is going to whisper us or we're going to get to see the next week or the next month or the next year. And this is how it all worked out. We are thrilled when we get to see that. I mean, we, and, and we do get to see that at times. But there's no promise that we get to see that in this life. A lot of times we go through difficult times and hardship and we won't know how God used it till we're with God in heaven. And God says, will you trust me in that? And of course, if we go back to what we said about God in the beginning of what we know, there's good facts. There's good reasons for why we should do this. And I love what Pastor Chuck always says to people when they're going through difficulty. He says, never trade what you don't know for what you do know. Because our temptation is always the what if and the how come and why God. 
He goes, you know what? I don't have an answer for that. But don't trade that, what you don't know, for what you do know. Because there's a lot that we do know. And that God is loving. He is trustworthy. He is perfect. And he's got a perfect plan. Sometimes he just says, trust me. And just try to hang on to the facts. And let me help you get through this whole thing. Amen? Well, let's pray. Father, of the Lord we will see the glory of the Lord we will see the glory of the Lord we will see the glory
nothing more.